This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Week 8 in college football may not be quite as monumental as Week 7, but still some really, really fun games on the docket for this weekend. We're going to break down those games with Dr. Ed Fang, get his read on those games and his favorite bets across Week number 8 here today. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Here with Dr. Ed Fang to get his read on this week's game. You can find Ed's uh, work over at powerrank.com and find ed on twitter at the power rank and ed week eight is coming in hot week seven though was a delight lived up to the hype how are you doing today i'm doing pretty well it was a lot of fun here in ann arbor where uh michigan unexpectedly for me at least dominated that uh game and uh i wish it would have been a situation in which i trusted my numbers more but i thought the market was pretty fair michigan minus seven and uh, they really dominated, right? I mean, we were sitting there watching in the first half, and Penn State was actually up 14 to 13, but there was one long run from Sean Clifford. Otherwise, they did nothing on offense, and the other score was a pick six off of a helmet. And and then you go into the second half, and you think it's got to regress to something a little bit closer, and it, and it just never did. So really good performance by Michigan. In some sense, I, I, I still think it's probably a little bit of an outlier performance. Mm-hmm. You know, I uh, – so we'll see. We'll see. I mean, we'll see really what happens when uh, Penn State plays Ohio State in a couple weeks. Yeah, Michigan 41 to 17, uh, the final score there. And that game was a noon game. So did you get a chance to watch the Tennessee Alabama game that night, given that the Michigan game was earlier on? Yeah, I got a chance to catch a, a bunch of the second half. Actually, the family joined me for actually both of them. Yeah. But that was, uh, it was pretty incredible going back and forth and. I was telling my children, well, Knoxville might burn tonight if Tennessee wins the game. And they're like, Dad, why, why would you burn your city when you win Great a game? And he's like, well, yeah, I know. It doesn't seem very smart. Yeah. They had fun. Um, well, they I'm definitely sure had a good they time. Had a riot in Knoxville. <laughs> I'm sure they had an amazing time. Yeah. I mean, like, it was just – I think that – it was one of those games where like you went in with pretty high expectations, but you always like think through, at least I do, you think through the paths to like it being disappointing, you know, like, okay, like I've got these high expectations, but maybe Alabama were underestimating them, stuff like that. They wind up rolling, but then like, it's like, oh, Tennessee's answering blow for blow. Yeah. And not only was it like a legitimate win where like yeah. it was back and forth affair, but it was entertaining the entire way. Like I know yeah. you, you like defensive struggles and like, those are fun too. They have their place. And I think that they have they have value as well, but like having a back and forth affair like that, where it's like the product of good offense rather than bad defense, I I think it's really hard to top that. Yeah, and especially late in the game, I thought Tennessee yeah. really really got screwed by that penalty in the end zone. I thought that that was an offensive pass interference. Couldn't really see it on the replay, but I mean, it didn't it didn't look particularly good. And then to lose that fumble on the the match point and recover from it, yeah. Kind of unbelievable. Yeah, really was. But kudos to them. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about Tennessee down the line here in the very near future once again. Really fun team, oh, really yeah. fun game, and a fun slate on tap week eight as well. We'll break down what Ed's numbers are saying about this week's biggest games and more in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread. Wherever you get your podcasts, we had our NFL Week 7 first look up yesterday. Our, our full breakdown of Week 7 is tomorrow, and our pro- player prop betting preview will be up on Friday as well at J.G. Zacharyson. So get those by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as as well. The NBA season is now underway, and it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in free bets if your bet doesn't win. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. You can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. 
Plus, with live betting, you'll get updated odds on games that have already started. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. So download FanDuel today to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Make every moment more this season with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. Refund issued is non-withdrawable free bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WIN-IT. In Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in louisiana 1-877-770-STOP in new york 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text to open y in tennessee call the red line at 1-800-889-979 in wyoming 1-800-522-4700 or in west virginia 1-800-GAMBLER.net let's go to week number eight now here in college football before we talk about the actual games i want to do a futures market check-in because we saw the alabama loss and alabama They'd had some tight games before that as well. So not just a, a one-game blip there for them. So let's talk about the futures market here. Right now, Ohio State is the favorite to win the national championship at FanDuel. They are plus 170. Georgia is plus 190. Alabama still lurking. They are 4-1 to one right now. Ed, when you look at these championship futures, any teams stand out to you as being undervalued right now? Well, I'd like you point out that Georgia is the second most favorite because all the chatter – in in ann arbor is about oh tennessee versus michigan yada 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 and let's not forget that tennessee has to play georgia is going to be at least a touchdown underdog mm -hmm. in that game so so georgia really still is a favorite to come out of there i i think tennessee is still still the underdog um yeah so for me you know not not too much value anywhere i mean i think that that sounds just about right to me i don't don't have any precise calculations on that but I mean, clearly those three teams are, are still going to be there. Uh, Alabama controls its own destiny. And I guess, I mean, I guess they just can't slip up against, you know, pretty tough division. So yeah, um, we will see, we will see what happens, but, um, but yeah, that seems just about right to me. Yeah. Tennessee 20 to one right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, Michigan 16 to one. Uh, Clemson is 12 to one. So some big games this weekend. Right. Let's stop with that Clemson game. They got Syracuse this week. Syracuse 13 and a half point dog. A total is 49 and a half. And we talked about Syracuse last week and pretty skeptical of them entering that game. And they didn't blow the doors off NC state, but like they did, they did cover. They did get a win there. Did they do enough in that game, Ed? to convince you that they're capable of covering a 13 and a half point spread against Clemson? Uh, no, not really. I mean, so I talked last week about North Carolina state plus three and a half and, 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 sorry, <laughs> and that, that didn't win, but did get a little bit of closing line movement because it, it closed at yeah, three. It did. You know, I was really surprised how well Syracuse was able to move the ball against a really good North Carolina state defense. That's really what happened there. Uh, they had a 52.7%, uh, success rate on offense and um yeah you know syracuse offense looks pretty good they're 19th when i look at my adjusted success rate they're not quite as good on defense they are 49th <sighs> am i convinced about syracuse no not really i mean it was it was kind of one game against a north carolina state team and maybe i mean obviously north carolina state didn't have a quarterback i tried to argue that that didn't matter so much maybe it does maybe i was wrong about that you know only time will tell um, and you know, and when you're talking about Clemson, I still think they're like, we, you know, when you look at Clemson was a 14 point favorite earlier, it's 13 and a half. Now when you have Clemson as a 14 point favorite against, you know, a respectable division opponent, I think you are making the assumption that Clemson is going back to the Clemson of three years ago. And I'm not sure that that is true as well either. Um, you know, when they're, they're, they're the offense is, eh. um, you know, the 45th one, when I look at adjusted success rate, 74th uh, in passing. So yeah, they, they had some success. Sure. But th those aren't, you know, that's not reminding anyone of the Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson days. Um, the defense has been better. Um, you know, they're up, they're up to 19th. When I look at adjusted success rate, when um, Colin Wilson was on, we talked about, I asked him whether how much they missed Brent Venables. 
And he said, well, I think Brent Venables misses Clemson. And, and that turned out probably to be the more accurate statement with yeah. just the, the free fall that Oklahoma <laughs> has been in over the last month. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, uh, um, I, I think there's probably, I would lean. So my number has to have uh, Clemson by about 10. So that suggests some value on Syracuse. Um, and I think it is difficult for a team to cover two touchdowns when the total is in the high forties. So is there value on Syracuse? Uh, probably. Um, I'm not too interested in it just because of, I I think there's just so many question marks about both these teams. I really don't have a read on where either one of them is going to head in the next couple of weeks or for the remainder of the season. So probably a stay away from me. Yeah. I think that for me, I've had a lot of this year where I've, seen value by numbers but had no interest in betting it. And I think it seems it's been a lot of situations where it's been teams I can't get a firm handle on. Um like, you know, and I think that potentially Syracuse could be one of those teams. I'll go back to Oklahoma really fast. Um because Bill Connolly wrote a piece about how sports books couldn't catch up to how bad Oklahoma was. And I was like, you know, I was like, oh yeah, that that's kind of funny to t- to think about, but I then thought about your model that has like the more aggressive updates for sure. recent data do you think that better equips you to like handle a situation where a team kind of seems to be a, a, in what you d- deem to be like a free fall for them no i mean my model hasn't been able to catch up to michigan state yeah and yeah no i i, I don't know I, I i think so when when you kind of tune the parameters of my model you you're, you're kind of making a guess on on average how how hard you should move these teams after results and you're going to be too low on some teams and you're going to be too high on others. And the art of it is to figure out when that is the case. Um, You know, I'm more familiar with Michigan state. Um, I actually think the model probably has it about right. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. the markets have gone pretty hard against them. And, and while I think they suck, I don't, don't, I'm not sure that they suck that bad. Yeah. And, And we'll obviously see, um, in there in, uh, in Michigan's next game here in Ann Arbor. But, um, so yeah, it's it's tough to know. Yeah, for sure. Well, Syracuse or Clemson to stay away for ad. Let's dive now into Ole Miss at LSU, where we've got LSU as a one and a half point favorite. Total is 68 and a half. It was 66 and a half yesterday, now at 68 and a half. So some movement towards the over there. Ole Miss 7 and 0, but now facing LSU in Baton Rouge. Pretty tough spot there. Who do you have winning this game? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty close to the market here. I have LSU by about a point. And still happy that they beat Florida outright. So uh, that was one of the, the best that I liked last week. Um, <laughs> the thing that interests me in this game is the total, right? So mm-hmm. you sent me an email about talking about this game. It was 66 and a half yesterday. Now it's up to 68 and a half. My model says about 59. I think there's, I, I, I think I would lean towards the under, but you know, Ole Miss is definitely an up-tempo team that is, under Lane Kiffin, always going to be better on offense than they are on defense. Right now, they're eighth in my adjusted success rate. They're better with rushing. They're seventh in the nation. Um, they have a quarterback in Jackson Tart that's been uh, a running threat. So they want to play up tempo. They, you know, and and they're facing an LSU defense that has that has been pretty good over the course of the season. Not against Tennessee, but otherwise been pretty good. So. And, and I do think LSU can score too against an Ole Miss defense that that doesn't look particularly good um, in my numbers. So, but still, you know, that's a pretty big gap. <laughs> it's like a nine point gap. And um, yeah, I'd be interested to see where the total goes in this game. Um, I, I mean, I'm staying away from. I'm. I would probably. Well, I would lean towards towards the under there, especially if that uh, is is continuing to get that high. But but I do see where points come from in this game. Yeah, uh, 68 and a half right now. I think that it would be wise to keep an eye on that, given that it has moved already uh, towards the over and maybe it's a situation where if it keeps on rising, you circle back later on this week. It, it's a minus 110 both ways, so it's possible it's it's settled in at 68 and a half and it might not be rising anymore. But if you agree with Ed's read and what his model is saying, under could be the play there. So keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on where the, if it keeps moving, uh, maybe you want to dive into that one eventually. But um I think that the under does make a lot of sense there, especially if you are about nine points below where that's at. Let's swing out to the Pac-12 right now and talk about UCLA at Oregon. Oregon six and a half point favorite here. Total is 69 and a half in this one. And we talked about UCLA quite a bit and they've pulled through in some really tough matchups. They've had impressive wins, but Oregon 
they've been on a roll ever since that Auburn game. So, or the Georgia game, I should say, uh, mm-hmm. how do you see this one playing out? Yeah. My numbers like Oregon by about a touchdown. It sees two really good teams on offense. Oregon is fifth. When I look at my adjusted success rate and their success rate was actually pretty good against Georgia. It looks like they were able to dink and dunk and, and, and kind of move the ball. Um, but uh, you know, obviously that didn't show much, <laughs> show up much on the scoreboard, but <laughs> You know, no explosive plays at all. So, and and they've been pretty good since then. Um, UCLA has also been uh, pretty amazing on 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 offense as well over the course of the season. They're sixth in my adjusted success rate. And then, you know, at this point in the season, you know, I still tend to rely on both the success rate and the yards per play adjusted for opponent. And both these defenses are better when I look at adjusted yards per play. So they they look better by yards per play, which means, okay, so maybe they're not that good of a defense at stopping opponents, but they've been able to eliminate, to at least reduce the effect of, of big plays. We expect the the kind of success rate numbers to be better. Um, so that would suggest that these defenses are worse uh, than, than what they look like in yards per play. So uh, it could be a lot of points in this game and uh, it should be a fun one out West. 69 and a half is a big number. I'm guessing you're staying away from that based on your read on that. Yeah. I mean, my total is like 67, so yeah. it's not too far off that. It probably should be just a little bit higher because, uh, yeah. uh, because of what the success rate says about the defense. So, um, yeah, but Oregon by about a touchdown. So we'll, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the market is, is, is pretty sharp on this one. So pretty good markets across the board in our three big games. Let's open up the board now and talk about other games in week eight where you're seeing value. What are you seeing that you like right now for week eight? Yeah, so the one game which I like is uh, it's probably Texas A&M minus three at South Carolina. So this one's kind of interesting to me. Uh, well, first of all, we have Haynes King, who the Texas A&M quarterback, who uh, has maybe the most peculiar throw him throwing motion of any quarterback that has made it to the <laughs> made it to the college level. Um, but, you know, he was the starter, had a terrible game against App State, lost a job. Max Johnson got hurt. Haynes King is back. And he got hurt at the end of the Alabama game. It looks like he's going to play. Um, it looks like there was a foot injury, but it looks like he will play. And, you know, it, it's one of these things where uh, earlier this season I had talked, maybe not on this show, but but I had, I definitely – my number suggested that the, the the offense was awful and the defense was pretty good, making them an under team. And since, uh, so that was before the Mississippi State game. Since then, the defense has gotten significantly better um, in, in the last two games. Uh, obviously, it helps that they didn't have to face Bryce Young in that game against Texas uh, against Alabama. But um, so so they've, they've been better. And I, I just think there's a significant talent gap here between what's going on on Texas A&M uh, compared to South Carolina. I mean, this was a program that was really bad in the last two years of, of Will Muschamp in 2019 and 2020. They bring in Shane Beamer last year who, uh, you know, had a pretty good turnaround at seven and six. And you uh, expected better because they, they brought in Spencer Rattler, the quarterback, um, you know, the offenses looked again, it's one of these situations where they've looked better by yards per play than success rate. So they're 39th, uh, in terms of yards per play by my metrics after schedule adjustments, they are 64th in success rate. Again, the latter is probably going to be closer to the truth. Um, and then, you know, their, their defense is, uh, is, is solid, but it, it's again, another unit that's a lot better by yards per play 32nd than they are by success rate 108. So and, and South Carolina was a defense that was good last year, and they brought a lot of their talent back. So the success rates number suggests that they're they're not as good. I just think there's a big talent difference. My primary model likes Texas A&M by six, and um, but a couple of other models that I look at, uh, market model where I'm looking at what the market has said this year, and also only data from the current season. Mm-hmm. Both of those suggest that. Texas A&M should win by at least four here. And, and the data from this year is accounting for the fact that their offense has really struggled, which I think makes it right. even potentially more important that you're seeing value there too. Right. And and it also accounts for South Carolina and the fact that they played some pretty terrible teams outside of the SEC. Right. So it accounts for all that. And that also says that 
Texas A&M minus three is a good bet. I, a lot of places have gotten off of three already. So uh, I do like Texas A&M minus three. Obviously, like it a little bit less at three and a half. But my model says six, and I think there's value there. Yeah, it is currently three at FanDuel Sportsbook, minus 110 uh, on the minus three right there. Uh, I think it was minus 104 at three and a half at some other books. So you could look around, try to get that three somewhere. But um, it is right now three at FanDuel Sportsbook. Again, minus 110 on that one that's all we got here for week number eight again pretty fun slate night maybe not the same firepower as last week but still some pretty fun games we'll see how these things play out uh, across the week ed plenty of stuff for you going on though uh, across the power rank and across the football analytics show what is going on this week there Right. I had Parker Fleming on the podcast nice. he's been a guest on on this show as well he's a quantitative college football analyst uh, he's been doing a lot of good work for the for the hammer as well. So yeah, we talked a lot more about his models, talked about some of the key games this week, and uh, yeah, check that out at the Football Analytics Show wherever you get your podcast. And then uh, still working on my newsletter over at thepowerrank.com. Uh, Seven Nugget Saturday is full of tips and bets and news and and humor. Uh, so check that out at thepowerrank.com. Awesome. And check out Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank. I am on Twitter at Jim Saunders. You can also make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread on your podcast platform of choice. And also you can find these up on the FanDuel YouTube page after they're posted over there as well. If you got any questions for us again, uh, check me out on Twitter at Jim Saunders. Back once again tomorrow with Ryan Williams breaking down NFL week number seven. Player prop show coming up on Friday with JJ Zacharias. And we'll talk to you all then. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 